Two, one, two. You know how we do with your boy BQ. Welcome back to episode number three of the Power Moves podcast, reviewing NWA Power each and every week. Now, I was very disappointed that last week I dropped the episode so late, and the numbers definitely reflected on it after a really good, successful first episode. So hopefully I can get back on the ball with episode number three here for NWA power so again this is the power moves podcast if you're listening on youtube and you prefer to listen on the streaming format you just got to look up the impact lounge wherever you listen to your podcast and you will be able to hear nwa power and if you're listening on a streaming platform and want to check out youtube and everything i have going on there just look up the impact lounge there as well so let's jump right into the episode i don't like to bs a whole lot when I do my podcast, talk about my week and things of that nature. I just kind of want to get into what you are here for, get into the content, provide that value for you. So three weeks in the, in, into the NWA, and you hear a lot of podcasters, YouTubers, wrestlers, review sites, various influencers. You always hear, you know, the words authentic, real, you know, and those, and that's true. That's really, really true. But I watched this third episode and I thought, what is, uh, what's something else that's making this special? Aside, aside from everything everyone else is talking about. You know, talking about the old school feeling and this and that. Okay, I get that. But what else makes this show really special? And I think what they have done and what they've been willing to do, which a lot of companies are afraid to do, is to just let talented people be talented let talented people be talented how important does nick aldis feel as a world champion with the nwa that doesn't mean you can just put the title on anybody and just let them be themselves and they're going to feel important but they're letting him be him and other companies you know there's Several other companies, you know, whether whether it's um, Impact or AEW and ROH to an extent, yeah, they let talent be them. But it, but at the same time, creative has to get behind them and say, okay, we trust you to be you, and we trust you to be in the main event, and we trust you with a large role with this character. And that's what I got from this. That's what I got from listening to Nick Aldis speak. Watching Marty Bell and Caleb Conley compete. You know, Eli Drake, I I already know what he brings to the table. Most people do. And another thing I really took away from this is that Tim Storm, between Tim Storm and Nick Aldis, like those guys are the NWA right now. So last week when we didn't have Tim Storm on there, we had had Nick Aldis, but he he was doing, you know, the backstage interviews, which I didn't. I didn't care for those last week. This time he was in the studio. When those guys were involved, the show feels a lot bigger because those are the ones, especially with Tim Storm, that you're most invested in emotionally because they've built that up for so long with him. So he feels like a a major star, and and they just let him work his talents to the best of his abilities. Now, Tim Storm in another company probably wouldn't work, but this is perfect for him. The opening match was Marty Bell. Um, she defeated Crystal, Crystal Rose. Basically a squash match. So my takeaways from this was that Marty Bell is much improved in the ring. And what I said in the opening about letting talented people be talented. You know, we've only seen... I think she was in the... Uh, wasn't Marty Bell in one of the uh, uh, NXT tournaments, the women's tournaments. I don't watch those, so I don't know, but I believe she was. But obviously I know of her... Know her of her work with the TNA and impact and the dollhouse and everything. And, you know, they never really gave Marty bell. Now, granted this match was, you know, I I don't think it was longer than three minutes and she's wrestled a lot of three minute matches on TV, but this was, you know, her in the driver's seat and they weren't afraid to allow her to do that. And I know with watching impact, I I can't think of a match where she had a, you know, a one-on-one match where they really trusted her to just go out there and do her thing. So, I, that was my big takeaway is that she's she's much improved 
and I, you know, I know she's continued to do independent dates and she was working a promotion fairly local to me out, uh, out by me for a little while before it folded. So I'm Marty Bell, someone I'm happy is with the company. I know she's really close with Allison K. I think they might be best friends, but I, uh, it's nice to see her involved and it looks like the, I would imagine she's going to be in the, in the title picture here sooner than later. This is the second women's match and she was a part of it and she won. So I would say that's really, really possible. Caleb Conley in the next match. Um, and she went with a, with a move. I, I forget what she, they called it. You know, she basically uses the pedigree. I think they called it an impact protect your neck or something along those lines. So, uh, but I thought she looked really good here. Caleb Conley, took on a gentleman by the name of Dan Parker. And this was another three-minute match, kind of a squash match. And this goes, refer to everything I just said about Marty Bell. I know Caleb Conley from his impact days. And I remember right before he signed, he was in a tag team match with Tony Nese on, I was watching Evolve, an Evolve show. Him and Tony Nese took on Drew Galloway and somebody. I don't remember. And, you know, Tony Nese moved on to WWE in the cruiserweight division, everything. And Caleb Conley moved on to Impact. Now, I can't really speak a whole lot on Tony Nese not watching that product, but, you know, I know that he has had some good matches and good angles. I think he might have, have been the champion. Might Maybe he's the champion now. And then Caleb comes to Impact. He's on the roster for nearly a year before ever wrestling. And in the first episode of the podcast, I had mentioned that it seems like Billy Corgan had his, his favorite, and I don't mean like golden boys, golden girls, but he had his favorites from when he was working with TNA. Some guys that you could tell he might have brought over or guys that he was, and guys and girls that he was like, okay, they're they're talented. You know, I like to see what I can do with them. You know, it's very clear that he has done that. And Caleb Conley, I think, was one of the signings that he was a part of with Impact. But he was on the program for a year, never debuted. Finally, is a random inclusion into a five-way X division championship match. So his first match is for <laughs> X division championship, but people were excited because, Oh my God, Caleb, like they just added Caleb Conley. Like people knew he had been around for a while and then he never had any ma meaningful matches. And it's very similar to what I said with Marty Bell. Like they were, they did not put Caleb Conley in a match to, they didn't trust him. They didn't allow him to just go out there and be talented. Yeah. He did. He went out and did some spots and things like that, but they never were just like, Hey, this, this up and comer, Caleb Conley, they never delivered him to be important. And then they did the cult of Lee thing, which was good, which was entertaining, but you know, he was kind of a comedy character. They, they always lost. And although they probably had some promise to maybe have a little, t you know, tag team title run, it didn't happen. So here he seems really confident. I think that he still learned a lot from those impact days though, working on TV and live crowd and everything. Um, he uh, he's had two matches so far. The first one was with Eli Drake, and I just thought he looked good. He looked confident. They just let him be confident. That the, the announcers acted like, "Hey, here's our up and comer, Caleb Conley." You know, just just in a way that he didn't get an impact. Like if he was wrestling, they're talking about something else or cracking jokes with each other. You know what I mean? So definitely felt more important on this show. So it was. I've never seen him win a match before, to be totally honest with you. And I've even seen him in a. Uh, independent shows you know a couple of them and he, he didn't win so th this was cool for me this was cool for me as a fan for because i liked him and you know he got a one got a got a win so those were the matches uh we'll get to the main event those were the first couple matches get to the main event but you know the show kind of kicked off eddie kingston went out there and this guy's great on the mic he's passionate and this is again this is just a great home for him they're just letting him be him they're they're allowing him to build up him in homicide in a way that, you know, I know I make a lot of impact references, but you know, they were just over there. And if you would have put homicide and, and Kingston on a team over there in impact and they were taken on LAX or whoever, you know, you, you knew that even though that the whole LAX OGs angle was really good, they were still afraid to give the OGs a lot of TV time in the ring. You know, they built most of their stuff up outside of the ring. But the three matches they had, Kingston had one by himself, and then the OGs had a couple squash matches. They were all two-minute matches, you know? So he, he's given the opportunity to really run with what he can do here on the mic, and I think that's really, really smart. 
the next backstage thing was with I keep saying backstage because that just <laughs> it just uh, it comes natural. Obviously, everything's done in studio there, but it's the Dawson's. I don't I don't care for the Dawson's a whole lot. It's not a diss on them personally. We just all like who we like and don't like. And I've never been a big fan of those like big bearded bruiser guys. You know, like the like I didn't like War Machine a whole lot. Uh, not just not disrespect to their talent or to the Dawson's talent. Just not my thing. Not my cup of tea. Cup of tea. You know the tag teams where the both guys look exactly the same. They just have a a singular first name, and then you got to try to tell them apart. And you you know you just know one guy's one guy and one guy's the other. You know, so they're they're not my cup of tea. And I didn't care for them all after the the first two episodes, but this one this one I actually kind of did because they're. You you got to appreciate the heat that they're getting. They, they wouldn't get this kind of heat in any other company. It doesn't plug them in anywhere else. They wouldn't. So they they've done a really good job with this team with with really generating a lot of heat. They won't wrestle Kingston and Homicide. And you know I thought the promo they cut here was a lot better than the first time that they were on the mic. We get a Thunder Rosa video package. So she's. Uh, I would imagine the next one we're going to see in action. And that's one of the ones people have been really excited about. Uh, Aaron Stevens. I didn't care for his promo last week. This one I connected with a lot more. And it, it told me, I'm going to, you know, because this is the theme of my episode here. They're just letting him be talented. And with WWE, we saw a lot of his talent. We saw what his strong points were. And then when he went to TNA, they, they got away from the strong points and try to make him a serious competitor and a main eventer, you know, the, the kind of what the WWE universe had wanted to see. They tried it and it didn't necessarily work. So I feel like what they're going for here is a mixture of the initial Damien Sandow character and the, you know, method actor type character. Like they're, they're almost bringing, you know, what brought him to the dance and then what got him really popular. And they're finding a hybrid of that, you know, instead of having him come over and try to be this white meat baby face star, which is what impact tried to do with him. And it worked initially, but because they, they pushed him too hard, too quickly, not to mention he showed up out of shape. It soured really, really fast. So with here, they said, okay, what makes this guy work? What makes him popular? So that's what I'm really getting out of this. They said we're going to take the two point the two, two most successful points in your career and find a hybrid. We're going to find something in the middle. So why while I didn't care last week for what he did, this I do. And I think he's he's creating he's establishing himself as a pretty good heel, which is great because he's he's a popular guy, but he's establishing himself as a as a heel pretty well. Tim Storm um they did his. This is something people were looking for, forward to. You know, was he gonna? I thought he was gonna retire or or something along those lines, since he couldn't wrestle for the title. I was hoping he wasn't because, like I said, he's kind of the NWA at this point. He they would be losing a big part of their their company if he were to be gone. Is he the most talented? You know, guy? Is he the youngest guy? No, but he's someone everyone's so emotionally invested into. Like you would be, you would be losing a a large chunk of what makes this show what it is that they got him. So Eli Drake comes out there, which is, it's weird because they're doing, in some cases you can't tell who's heel, who's baby face. And it's like Eli Drake, so far as we've heard him speak, kind of sounds like a clear cut heel. And then James Storm kind of cuts some heel shit, but then is doing baby face stuff. So some guys, I don't really know what they're trying to do with them, but Eli Drake goes out there and heel, you know, teams up with Tim Storm, you know, at, tells Tim Storm, I want to team up with you for the tag team titles, babyface. So I was happy to see to see the two of them together. I liked that a lot, but I, at the same time, kind of don't get it. <laughs> so so it, it's, it's really hard to predict what they're doing, but I'm going to go back to the first episode where I said, you know, even, even when there's the heel face dynamic, it seems like a lot of what with the exception of a team like the Dawson's and everything, you know, the, the clear cut heels. It seems like there's a lot of really, really mutual respect between the wrestlers. And you see that with Nick Aldis. He's a heel champion. But instead of just going out there and making people boo him, he's not trying to be a, a, like a cool heel. But he's still putting over other competitors and putting over the crowd 
you know, because he's establishing himself as this really important champion that understands what's important in professional for professional wrestling and that there's no company without the fans. Like he's establishing himself as being in tune with that and not, you know, calling the fans a bunch of idiots and everything. So they support him in that sense, which makes the, the championship important because the champion f- feels that everything else is important. Everything else plays a role. He knows you have to have a good supporting cast to quote Aaron Stevens. You have to have good champions titles that mean something matches that mean something emotions angles that mean something the crowd has to care he, he he delivers all that and you feel that he knows that but then there's the whole Camille thing where she's not speaking he says heel stuff at the same time too you know so I just they just I don't know I wish I could sometimes just sit in a creative meeting and like I've, I've tried to sit here and try to decipher what they're trying to do with certain people. I would love to sit in a creative meeting and just really hear what it is that they're doing. And one segment that was kind of odd was Josephus. And again, I said this last week or the first week. I don't even know. I like his, we got, we did get a, you know, this uh, appearance from the spiritual advisors today, but I liked what he was doing with that. You know, right now where his hair is kind of growing out from being shaved and he doesn't have the, the garb that he wears, like he he just kind of looks like a jabron to me, you know, like he just looks like a dude. So I hope they're able to tap into uh, some of his past character work a little bit and refine him a little. But he he was trying to call James Storm out there to shake his hand, and then Cole Cabana randomly. I mean, and it seems like Cole could, Cole Cabana was playing along with it, but then he just got the powder to the eyes. I just didn't get it. I I didn't get it at all. And then James Storm comes, kicks Josephus. Is gonna, then he's going to kick Colt Cabana. Why, though? I don't know. And then Ken, Ken Anderson saves him. I didn't get it. Flat out didn't get it. Whatever they were trying to portray to the audience with this angle, I, I'm lost. I, I have no, no, no clue. So Joe Galley, um, he interviews Nick Aldis. I enjoyed this. I didn't like the interview last week. I enjoyed this one. Um, I'm glad that, you know, they're continuing the angle. I wish that there was a slower burn with the, why is he letting Camille talk? I mean, the next week he's like, I'm going to ask the hard hitting questions. Why couldn't she talk? You know, I would have loved to see just, just the slower build a couple more weeks. of, And then we're realizing she's not able to speak rather than just assuming after one episode. But that that's, that's little because they're still doing Good stuff with that. So um, Nick Aldis, again, says heel shit, but then he's putting over a guy like Ricky Starks, who they're obviously very high on. And, um, you know, that's one of the guys they really see with the future of the promotion and everything. And he's in a good position because he, he's he's young, and he's the one that they look like they're going to throw the Rockets on. So he's in a good position. He, he could go to NXT or something like that and just, just – be in the mix and, and get lost. You know what I mean? But here he's actually at a, at a young age getting an opportunity to really shine and be a, be a household, you know, hopefully be a household name one day. But there are a lot of people watching NWA right now. So everyone who's on TV right now is getting really extra or uh, part of the program, I should say, is getting really, really excellent exposure. So Nick Aldis did put him over. And Joe Galli said, well, I'm not allowed to ask him about the Camille thing anymore. I'm just going to talk to him about future contenders and, I was hoping we were going to find out who that contender was, that future contender, but he did go back to the Camille thing, and you know, and then they they took off. So this was still done well, though. Uh, I truly thought so. So the main event was the Dawsons against Eli Drake and Tim Storm, and he, you know, he invited Tim Storm to be his partner, and he he accepted after saying he had to check with Mama Storm or or whatever it was. I thought the match was was good. I, I didn't know what to expect because I haven't I, I didn't really care a whole lot for the Dawson so far as I said so I didn't know if I was gonna like the match I was like okay well I like Eli Drake and Tim Storm a lot but the pace was good the physicality is good as wrestling was good Eli Drake really stood out to me here doing a lot of what I know from him for impact like he's he didn't try to fix what wasn't broken he just does what he does and he really has the crowd in the palm of his hands with everything that he does. And then Tim Storm looked good too. I mean, Tim Storm is 
obviously older, but I mean, you know, and there's some things he can't do in the ring. You know, they've been a couple of times he gets rolled up. Like that's how we lost a couple of weeks ago. And it just looks bad because obviously physically there's some things that are going to be difficult for him to do. But for the most part, everything he does in the ring is good. And, um, I was curious who was going to win this match because, you know, you want to push Eli Drake and Tim storm, if that's going to be a big deal. But then the Dawson's can't really take a loss either. So they're, they're really hitching the wagon to the Dawson's as a, as a big heel tag team. And now they've got, you know, they've got beef with Kingston and Homicide who said they won't wrestle. And now, you know, maybe there's even a little beef with Eli Drake or, and Tim Storm. So they, they end up winning the match. You know, uh, I think he, I think it was like a power slam that he went, kind of modified power slam he wins with. I haven't seen a match in like that in a little while. So this kind of breaks off into a couple things. What's next for the Dawson's They're Obviously, well, we know what's next for them, but how is that going to shake out? And then it branches even more off into, well, what's, what's next for Tim storm? What's next for Eli Drake is Eli Drake going to work with something with James storm. Are the, are these two going to stay together in a way, you know, there, there leaves some intrigue. It's not necessarily a cliffhanger, but there's, there's some intrigue for, What's, what's, you know, what's next? And then Homicide and Kingston run them off. I love seeing Homicide and Kingston, Homicide and Kingston matter. I love seeing them matter. I love seeing all these guys matter. Everyone matters. That's what, that's what just for me makes this show so fun to watch. Everyone fucking matters. Like no one's just out there as a jobber. Like they bring someone in to be a jobber. They don't use the talent on the roster to do that. So this was a good episode. This was my, out of the three, this was my second favorite episode. And I can't wait to see what they do next week. I'm, I'm going to imagine Thunder Rosa is going to be in action. And there will be a fall, some fallout from what happened this week. But good show. Good job, NWA. I hope the uh, numbers continue to be good. And thanks for checking out Power Moves. I'm your boy BQ, and I'm out. Peace.